All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to uh, the Warren Lecture uh, uh, Seminar on uh, the Friday before Thanksgiving. Um, today's a really special lecture. Uh, this is the Catherine and Arthur Celine Lecture. And so um, the Catherine and Arthur Celine Lectures are supported by a fund that was established in 1986 by the Celine family to reflect their values expressed by Catherine and Arthur Celine um, in their professional and volunteer activities. This is a yearly lecture, <coughs> and it alternates between the Department of Civil Engineering, uh, Civil Environmental and Geoengineering, and the School of Social Work. And so these were two um, areas that the Salines um, held close to their, their hearts, and so they wanted to make sure that these, these departments were able to continue uh, this legacy of inviting speakers to come. Uh, so today we have two members of the Celine family with us, uh, Tammy Celine Magny, who's right here, and her husband Mark Magny. And uh, both Tammy and Mark are UMN alumni, and Mark has actually graciously served on our advisory board in the department. And so they're uh, very involved. Um, they've been uh, plugging into our EWB chapter here, and so it's really great to have them here and have them as part of our community. So uh, thank you two for joining us, and thanks to everyone else for joining us. Um, we also may have some Celine family members on Zoom, uh, which, is, which would be great. So um, I just want to thank everyone for being here again, and really give my thanks to the Celine family for um, the gift of this lecture series. It really enables our department to bring in outstanding uh, speakers from across the country, and uh, we really value that opportunity. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ali Reza to um, introduce our speaker, Kerry Watson. Thank you, Paige. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for, to everyone uh, in the room and on Zoom call. And again, special thanks to Saving Family. Uh, it's my honor to introduce our speaker, Professor Kerry Watkins, uh, an associate professor at the uh, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of California, Davis. And um, Kerry, as of recently, is uh, the director of the new, new USDOT funded Center for Emissions Reduction, <coughs> Resiliency, and Climate Equity in Transportation. Prior to joining um, UC Davis, uh, uh, Kerry was an associate professor and um, Frederick Law Olmsted uh, um, endowed uh, associate professor at Georgia Tech. Um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, she received her PhD from the University of Washington. Yes. And prior to that, she had about 10 years of um, uh, uh, work experience in transportation consulting. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great honor to have uh, Carrie presenting in today's seminar. And without further ado, uh, let's uh, hear from Carrie. Great. Thank you. Uh, All right, I have one. Well, thank you so much for having me. I also wanted to thank uh, the Saline family so much for uh, your contribution to have this type of academic forum. Um, it's a vital thing for us to be able to come and share our research across different universities, especially in the area of grand challenges, and I would say especially in the area of climate change in particular, which is what, what much of my research associates with, as you heard, with the new center that I direct. So thank you again for your contribution and for having me. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about the problems that we have uh, that the world of transportation has created. The average American commuter wastes 54 extra hours per year in traffic delays. Unintentional injury, mostly from motor vehicle crashes, is the number one cause of death for people ages 1 through 44. Transportation accounted for 29% of US greenhouse gas emissions in 2021. And 42.4% of adults and 19.3% of youth in the US are classified as obese. And we know from research that obesity risk increases 6% with every additional hour that we spend per day commuting in a car. So my research focuses on how do we address these kinds of issues, because for a long time with the transportation systems that we've built, we've not been addressing these issues. 
So I'm guessing similar to here, most colleges of engineering have some sort of graphic like this. This is the one for the University of California at Davis. And our College of Engineering focuses on advancing human health, on revolutionizing energy systems, on strengthening climate resilience, and on transforming mobility. And the sales piece that I always give internally within our university is, well, guess what? I'm gonna tell you research that will literally do all four of these things because by transforming mobility, we can actually make gains in the other three areas as well. And a lot of what I do comes back to this classic diagram that many of you in the room who've worked in transportation a long time have probably seen before, that we're not very efficient when we travel around in individual cars for every place that we go. There are much better ways for all those reasons I already listed, but simply for space reasons, if we focus on getting people to move collectively on public transportation, and if we focus on right-sizing the vehicles that we're in by using things like bikes and other micro-mobility devices. And instead, what we're often focused on in transportation, particularly in civil engineering, is can we do things like transportation network companies? Can we use driverless vehicles? Can we use electric vehicles to solve these problems? But the truth is, the picture doesn't change when we use these vehicles. And I could give a whole other lecture about why that's true, but instead I'm gonna focus on my own research, which is much more focused on how do we move public transportation from being this <laughs> to being this? And how do we move cycling in cities from being this to being this? And what I posit is that how we use our physical space and the priority and separation that we give for active and public transportation is critical to the future of our transportation systems and broader things like climate, safety, all of these other issues that I pointed out at the beginning. So I'm gonna focus on two things today. I structured the lecture to talk first about how do we get people to ride transit, and then second on how do we get people to actually bike. So first, let's talk about transit. How do we get people to actually uh, ride transit? I'm not gonna talk about one study. I'm actually gonna go across multiple things that I've worked on, like I said, in a 20-year career at this point and uh, approaching that in academia. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about is kind of how I got my start in academia. In my own dissertation, I did a lot of work at looking at how information can make a difference to transit riders. Um, and so real-time information in particular, having some control back over your trip is where I got my career start. Um, and for more than a decade at this point, I've been doing research with an organization called the Open Transit Software Foundation, and they run a project called One Bus Away that I and someone in computer science created as part of our dissertations. What One Bus Away is, is it's a suite of tools that provides real-time information about the bus, about the train, tracking these vehicles. At this point, this is second nature. When we very first started this project long, long ago, this was revolutionary. The revolutionary part that still comes is that this is an open source software, and so any region, any transit agency can adopt it and use it internally without having to pay outside vendors, uh, so it's a great tool for smaller transit agencies, and we have quite a few cities across the U.S. and across the world that use our code base of One Bus Away in order to run their real-time information system. And the whole point of it was to make using transit easier, but also it gives us access to data and people so that we conduct research on how it does make a difference. Um, and this is an example of what you get for anybody in the room who's not a transit user and doesn't use things like Google Maps or the transit app or things like that. It looks very similar to things like the transit app, but essentially you're just getting information at any particular stop, how many minutes until the next bus is coming. And over time, uh, One Bus Away has existed for a long time at this point. We've developed multiple different apps and as new technology comes out, Pebble Watches and Amazon Alexas and all of these things, we create a, a new version of it that can be used across all of these different kinds of uh, devices. 
And my role within the organization for years has been conducting research. Um, so this started off in my own dissertation with looking at people's wait time experience. So um, we've known that we wait our wait time as opposed to our travel time much longer. If you have ever, I'm sure everyone in the room has waited at a doctor's appointment or a dentist appointment, right? They do things like put a fish tank in the office so that you don't feel like you're waiting as long. When you're waiting on an elevator, they'll put a mirror because it turns out we love to look at ourselves. And so if they put a mirror there, you don't feel like you're waiting as long. Well, this is true in transit as well. And this is part of the reason that people are drawn more to driving in cars as opposed to having to wait on the street corner. Even if we can make your experience better in the transit vehicle so that the times are comparable, you feel that wait time more than you do time in transit. And so this was my original work from my dissertation where we did a whole series of studies. And it turns out that giving you this information in the palm of your hand makes that wait time experience different. It makes it more in line with the actual amount of time that you're waiting. And we even found that people don't go to stops as soon as, as they might have otherwise because they know, oh, the bus is late, so I'm going to wait three minutes. I'm going to sit at my desk those extra couple of minutes, not go wait out in the Minnesota cold for the bus that I'm waiting for. So after doing this work, the big question in my mind was, how does this actually change ridership? It's great that we're saying that people are having a better experience, but do they actually ride transit more because of having better information in the palm of their hand? And so my first PhD student and I did a series of studies looking at the, research, the ridership impacts of having this real-time information available. And one of the be best studies that we did was actually a natural experiment that occurred in New York City because they rolled out their real-time information on a borough-by-borough -borough basis. And so it gave us this fantastic natural experiment where we could look at how much ridership change were we seeing in one borough where they had rolled it out versus using all the other boroughs as a control. And unless there were other major things happening in one borough that weren't in another, this really gave us this beautiful natural experiment to understand how much could something like better information change ridership. And so the way that New York City rolled this out, in February of 2011, they did their first pilot of this in Brooklyn, and then they added Staten Island, then they added Bron the Bronx, then they added Manhattan, then they added Queens and Brooklyn as a whole. Um, and through that, we were able to do this, this uh, experiment, essentially, this naturally occurring experiment, to understand what the impacts of ridership were. In addition, we did comparable studies in Tampa and in Atlanta using slightly different experiments. In Tampa, we actually had control of the rollout of real-time information ourselves. And so we had an experiment group and a control group where we only gave real-time information to our experiment group and we did surveys of our control group at the same time. And we could look at their differences in their ridership experience. We also did this in Atlanta where we had smart card data and we could look back at how many trips people had taken before the real time was launched and how many trips they took afterwards. The difference there is in um, Atlanta, we would only be using people who were already transit riders in some way. And in Tampa, it's a much more transit reliant population. So in both of those places, we saw little evidence for increasing trips. But in a place like New York City, we saw that we could increase trips on the route level. The average weekday was about 1.6% across the entire network and about 2.3% on their most major routes. So just by giving people better information about the transit service, we could increase ridership across an a, a area as big as New, at New York City, MTA, their whole bus system by 2.3%. So first thing that people need is control of their trip by having excellent information. Second study was more recent. This was a whole series of work that I did funded by many different agencies um, on what is it that causes transit ridership to grow in various cities. And so we did a study for the Transit Cooperative Research Program. This is an arm of the Transportation Research Board, for those of you who work in this industry. 
Um, and we did a report called The Recent Decline in Public Transportation Ridership, Analysis, Causes, and Responses. And the point of this work was to understand which factors were contributing in what ways to declines that we were already seeing pre-COVID in transit ridership over about the course of a decade, and to identify strategies that might actually mitigate that and to try to measure how effective those strategies were. So one of the major pieces of analysis that we did as part of this work was we did this multi-city ridership change evaluation where we, we know that local factors affect transit ridership, making it very hard for us to generalize. Um, so what we did was we looked across 247 different metro areas. Um, many changes, many things are changing at the same time. So we allow different locations to serve as different control groups, similar to the natural experiment that I talked about at the beginning. Um, and regression lets us separate out the effects of each of these different things that were happening simultaneously. Um, we used year-over-year -year change, so we used fixed effects to account for this year-over-year -year for things that are not changing. Um, and because we were using regression models, we're able to look at the sensitivity or create elasticities for each of these different changes that are occurring at the same time. And we can look at the relative contribution of each of them. Um, however, 247 metro areas, that's pretty complicated, so we actually did this where we were looking at the larger metro areas, the medium size, the small, and seeing sort of trends across all of them. And then New York City doesn't really cluster with any other transit agency in the country, so you usually have to pull them out and do analysis separately for a place like New York. So what did we find? Again, this is using data from 2012 to 2018, so we're talking pre-COVID. Um, we found that there were two things that happened over this time period that were contributing to increases in ridership. The first was more service. So I know you have at least one person in the room who worked for a transit agency for quite some time, and he can tell you what drives transit ridership is having more service out on the street. Even if you don't do a fabulous job at all the other things I'm gonna talk about, you at least have to have the buses and the light rail vehicles out there in frequent enough ways that it enables someone to actually have this be a reasonable choice. Um, so in places where more service was put out there, we saw increases of three to 5% um, in bus ridership in places where more service would, was put out there on the rail side, we saw even greater increases in ridership, 10 to 18%. We also know that land use is a big driver of transit ridership. So in places where population and employment is growing, we see transit ridership growing. But it's a little more complicated than that because we also need density for transit to work well. And so if the land use patterns are changing so that people are living in less dense environments, then we're gonna lose ridership instead. And so what we saw that was from land use changes that were occurring in various places, we were seeing growth in transit ridership, but it was offset a bit by the fact that we are de-densifying. And remember, this was pre-COVID, <laughs> right? And I think we all know some of the things that have been happening post-COVID that I'll get to in a minute. So that's the positive side of the story. What else did we see? Well, lots of things were pointing to declines in transit ridership. Uh, the first was income and household characteristics. So median incomes were going up, car ownership was going up, more people were working from home already in this time period, and each of these things were decreasing transit ridership on order of about 2%. Similarly, transit was becoming more expensive. So after adjusting for inflation, bus and rail fares were going up over this time period. The changes weren't uniform, um, but we saw uh, fare increases resulting in about zero to four percent less ridership over the time period. We also saw that driving was becoming less expensive. So you want people to take transit more and drive less, you need to charge them more for driving. And so as gas prices go up, I think sometimes I joke with my husband who happens to be in the back of the room, every time gas, is, gas prices go up, I cheer, the rest of the country groans, but I cheer. <laughs> 
because that is what we need to happen. So um, essentially, as gas prices were declining over this time period, we saw that we were losing 4% of transit ridership to this decrease in gas prices because it's not uniform across the country. So we can look at these things. And then um, new modes. So this was the big piece that sort of, at the time, shocked the industry because there was a prevailing opinion that transportation network companies, as we call them, so this is Uber, Lyft, all of these rideshare type services, they were advertising themselves as something that was complementary to transit, that was helping cities. We now know, study after study has shown, they increase congestion, they take away transit ridership. We were the first to show this for transit ridership, though. Previous studies, these things were in their infancy, and we hadn't really seen the impacts. When we did this work, we were able to show that these new competing modes were actually decreasing bus ridership in particular by 10 to 14%. So they were really hitting bus ridership pre-COVID and even hitting rail ridership, particularly in medium-sized cities where you don't have sort of as robust of a network, as frequent of service. Um, they were even hitting rail ridership there. So that tells you a little bit about how do we actually get people to ride transit? And then COVID hit. <laughs> so this is a graphic of transit ridership starting in 1920, running all the way through 2020. Um, and you can see we sort of had our heyday in the streetcar era that many people in the room probably know about. And we were generally sort of increasing because rail ridership was increasing over time, although bus ridership was was already having a lot of trouble. And then we can see sort of this drop off that was occurring and then COVID hit. So we happened to come out with this report right as all of this was happening. So we were using old data, but we were trying to make broader conclusions. And I've since done some work looking at, you know, what have the COVID impacts on transit ridership been? It has decimated transit ridership. Some agencies are now starting to recover, um, but it was definitely a, a difficult time for transit. Um, but the lessons learned are not just from this piece of work, but we also did a number of other studies that I've got a long list on the next slide that you can look up. I've actually tried to put the papers, all of this comes from at the bottom of every slide. So if anybody wants to go back and read in more detail about the methodology, things like that that I'm skipping over, uh, you can do so. So key lessons learned. Uh, we have to rethink the mission, standards, metrics, and service delivery. We know that more service means more ridership, but we also showed that bus network redesigns, things like that can add ridership to a, a system. So if you have a bus network that hasn't been altered since the 1960s, let's say, um, and you're still running that same network, making a concerted effort to look at it again and make sure that you're running routes in the right places and you're actually capturing and reflecting land uses, that's a really good strategy. Um, we also did a future strategy analysis that showed that by reallocating existing service in particular areas, we were able to show increases in ridership as predicted by simulation models. Um, so again, having really good transit planners is an important thing. We also looked at rethinking metrics because the focus on ridership is not always telling the story of what transit does well. Uh, transit serves a lot of people, and we saw in COVID how important it was that we were able to get critical workers to critical jobs on the transit system, even if many other people were not riding transit at the time. And having metrics that look at accessibility, uh, as you do very well here in, at the University of Minnesota, these kinds of metrics are key that we don't only focus on ridership, and we actually focus on how robust the system is. Um, we also looked at fair discounts and fair policy, and this was very much directed at uh, studies that we were doing as part of this, but also what was happening during COVID. When people no longer commute every day of the week and need to buy a monthly pass, the monthly pass doesn't do a lot of good anymore. We have to be thinking about new models of how we can treat fair media, paying for fares on transit, fair policies. So 
um, things like uh, fare capping, where as you pay and you take more and more trips throughout a month or a year or whatever your time period is, that you start getting discounts over time automatically without having to invest in that monthly pass. These are the kinds of things that we need to be moving towards in this post-COVID era. But we also saw through a number of our case studies that specific discounts, things like that, can entice people to take transit and they might actually stick with it in many cases. We also saw that it was key to give transit priority and this was actually partially from a study that we did right here in Minnesota <laughs> with someone in the room who was one of our partners at the agency at the time. Um, what we saw was we saw substantial increases from the light rail system, from new lines that were being built here, um, and even from bus rapid transit that was being developed. Uh, in both the Twin Cities area, but also in Cleveland, we looked at their different bus rapid transit systems. And basically, the more priority they gave where those vehicles were increasing travel time, improving reliability, then they gained ridership equal to those things. If it was more of a bus rapid transit where they were just trying to throw out their, you know, a, a nice motto and nice stations and things like that, it didn't necessarily increase ridership to the same degree. Um, I would say one of the big lessons learned from that first work is careful partnerships with mobility providers. So what we showed was transit ridership was really hurting as a result of these uh, various services entering the market. Um, E-scooters, however, so the e-mobility devices uh, did not have as negative of an impact. In fact, we did one study where we showed that for express routes, longer distance things, they actually increased ridership as opposed to local transit service they might have hurt ridership a little bit, although it was not statistically significant. So we really showed no change. Um, however, the ride hail vehicles reducing ridership substantially. And then finally, encouraging transit oriented density. Like I said, many of the things that we were doing were pointing to the fact that we have to have transportation and land use in partnership. We can't be building very, very sprawling kinds of properties and then expecting the transit agency to be able to efficiently serve those areas. Uh, this is a particular thing in California right now because we're facing a housing crisis. And so we're trying to make sure that housing and transportation are intricately linked as we try to build more and more housing to pull ourselves out of that crisis. So then the last transit study that I want to talk to you about, this is going to be pretty quick, but I wanted to put a plug in for a center that I led for a couple of years at Georgia Tech right before my move called T-Score, or I think I have it on the previous side, Transit Serving Communities Optimally, Responsively, and Efficiently. I, I'm known for really long titles, um, so we use the acronyms most of the time. So in this case, we just call it T-Score. Um, the whole idea of this, this whole center and the work that we did through it was we were trying to look at new strategies that might combat this loss in ridership that we were seeing. Um, and at this point, COVID had hit, and so we knew we had even bigger problems than what we were showing in our earlier work. Um, so we had two different tracks, one where we were using simulation models, optimization models to try to understand how can we do a better job of integrating newer things like on-demand services, things like that. But at the same time, we were doing the community track piece where we were serving agencies and serving people to try to understand, okay, are these optimizations and simulations actually reflecting what people will respond to? Because they don't always, right? We can do these very robust, amazing models um, and find out that all of our inputs were not based on the reality of what people want to see and do and things like that. So we were trying to tie both of these together. And then in addition, we did some more uh, qualitative work in generating strategies and then evaluating those strategies that would be fed through both of these tracks. Um, so one of the coolest things that we did through this actually was a series of thought leader interviews. Basically during COVID, there was sort of this frozen time period where we were all very stressed about what is the future gonna br bring. We were breaking all of our models. Nobody knew what was actually gonna happen. And we thought, 
we're just gonna do a bunch of interviews with thought leaders throughout the industry and see if we can find common themes across all of them to try to inform our strategies. And so we talked to uh, 22 different transit thought leaders. Uh, it was actually, for somebody who does a fair amount of survey research, it was an amazing response. <laughs> I'm lucky when I get 10% of the people I send a survey out to to actually answer my, my survey. We contacted 32 people and 22 of these people, you know, very prominent people in the industry agreed to give us an hour of their time to talk about this. So um, it was a great experience. We selected them based on being people who were running transit agencies, people who were doing research in transit, and people who I would call innovators, who are really trying to challenge the norms of, of what it is that we're doing in the industry. We wanted to talk to all of them. And I have a whole paper that you can look up um, about all of this. This is one part of it. There's another part as well um, that we're in the process of actually publishing right now. But essentially, we did these interviews, we coded them in, in Vivo software, and we asked a series of questions about COVID, about fair innovation, about micromobility, on-demand services, how we do public-private relationships better, and then what new metrics we might be trying to introduce. Uh, the good news for all of you is they really liked accessibility metrics, so keep going on that vein. Um, the one that I'm going to take the time to talk about um, in the interest of time is just COVID-19, what they saw, uh, because it was eerie what they were saying at the time and what we've seen pl play out since then. So they said they think the hybrid schedule, having to go to work a couple days a week, is going to stick around. People are not going to be daily commuters anymore, but they're not going to be allowed to work from home in really vast numbers. And we've kind of seen this play out, and it's continuing to play out over time. Um, but what they said was even a 5 to 10% reduction in, in congestion is going to have an immense impact on transit because of the relationship, if anybody knows all of the, the congestion equations and such. Um, and, and that is exactly what we've seen play out, right? Transit ridership is still having trouble recovering because of this. Um, they talked about how it was going to be more difficult to plan, that when you have people not making commute trips, it's a lot harder for us to serve non-commute trips than commute trips, although it does open it up so that we don't have this really big peak rush on transit. We can spread it out more across the day, um, but that was going to be a difficulty in all of it, um, so less extreme peaks. Um, and they said that buses have and will continue to recover more than rail because of the socio-demographic differences in who takes bus versus rail, and that's exactly what we've seen. So over time, we've seen that bus ridership is really almost back up to what it was pre-COVID. Rail ridership, especially things like commuter rail that are very commuter focused, still very, very low. And the difficulty is those are our fixed assets. Because the last part that I want to talk about is essentially what I think we need to do. We need more of these fixed assets. When we're talking bus or rail, anything, we have to be giving priority to transit over the automobile trip or you're never gonna pull people into transit. I think inherently all of us know this who work in this world, and yet we still don't do it right. We still make little concessions here and there where the service is not as fast as it could be, where the service is not as reliable as it could be, because we're not giving it the priority that it should have over automobiles. So HOV lanes, great, transit lanes better, things like bus rapid transit or fully dedicated light rail, even better. And this is key in this world of driverless vehicles when if we have individually owned driverless vehicles, more congestion is gonna be created and it's gonna be even more important for people to have an option that pulls them out of that congestion. The other thing that we do wrong a lot that I see is we chase technology, right? Hyperloop, the whole world is gonna be solved by gondolas going in and you know, every city across America. None of this is true, right? We can't let technology be the foundation of what we're, by, what we're building. We have to think about the network, how we serve people, how we connect places, and then we match the technology to do that well. So if you have a location where gondola makes sense because there's a huge ravine or you're going over water or something like that, that's great. But something like Hyperloop, we, the technology of tunneling can be used for the technologies that we already have today, and we don't really have to wait for this kind of technology to be developed when we could do something maglev-based today based on amazing 
Japanese and German technology that has been in place for decades and works very, very well in other places. So we don't always have to be re reinventing the wheel as Americans. There's really great technology. We just have to be paying for it and putting it in place. And then finally, back to my roots in transit, knowledge is power. The more information we can give people, the better that quality that information is. That's how you get somebody to give up control of their trip and be willing to get out of their car. Without that kind of control and that experience, they're never going to do that. I seem running short, shorter on time than I thought it would be, so <laughs> let's get to bikes. <laughs> so how do we get people to take bikes? We did a couple of studies in this area as well. Um, the first one was also a TRB program called the National Cooperative Highway Research Program. We did a report here about bicyclist fa um, facility preferences and how bike facilities, again, all about that space, that right away and how we allocate it, how they will increase bike trips. So the goal here was to understand preferences among people who are already biking, but also preferences among people who are not currently biking. So we did a huge survey effort where we surveyed more than 2,500 individuals, 40,000 households were contacted to get this kind of response, and we looked at their perceptions about the type of bike facility, the number of lanes, whether there was on-street parking, all of these kinds of things, and we looked at the kind of cyclists they were. And we tried to segment this data, we did all kinds of work on this, many, many studies that you guys can pull up. But the basic takeaway from this, we did this user preference analysis where we took an image and we modified the exact same image over and over again so that it was very, very standard. You can see here we've got a Shero, here we've put a bike lane in, two lanes in both, both uh, cases. We were very careful about making it look like this middle America small town. It could be like a suburb just outside of a big city. It could be like a, you know, like I said, smaller town. Um, we were very purposeful about all of this. And we were asking people, biking on a road like this, would it be comfortable? Would it be safe? And would it be something that you would try? And so our images continued to be like a buffered bike lane. This is one with only one lane in each direction. A uh, protected cycle track type configuration, and we asked them how they felt about all of these. And so, as you go up the spectrum from a Shero to a bike lane to a buffered bike lane to some sort of a protected bike lane, we had a couple of different ones. I won't go into what the dashes are and why, but um, we saw that more and more people felt more comfortable, felt safer, and were willing to try. And I've drawn a line here at the 3.0, it was a Likert scale. So that's basically, uh, they're saying they're not comfortable with, with Shero's, they're not, they don't feel safe. When you get to bike lanes, you see some differences where depending on the configuration with parking and number of lanes and such, um, there were differences in how, how comfortable just a bike lane was gonna make people feel. Um, but as we got towards uh, a buffered and definitely protected bicycle infrastructure, everyone, was willing to bike, all right? So it made a world of difference pulling them out of that stream of traffic. So essentially, the, the lessons learned from this work, separated or protected facilities should be a priority in bike facility design. We should minimize the impact of parking, having on-street parking adjacent to bike facilities. We know that from safety, but also perception studies that it is not helpful. Um, providing clear delineations between cycling and walking when you have multi-use trails and you have lots of people on them. Uh, limited use of Sharrows. We're now starting to understand that Sharrows really do nothing except provide a link in where there's gaps in a, a true network. Um, let me see what else on here do I really want to talk about. One big piece was we tried to evaluate individual facilities, and that was very difficult because we didn't see major changes when you're putting in a one-mile bike lane because most people's trips are not only going to use that one-mile bike lane. And we were doing this in the south where there was not a very robust network like here in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, and so you really have to get to the point where you have that full network and you're filling in the gaps to make a bigger difference. The last one that I want to talk about is what we've been moving into since that work was trying to understand when people are actually on bikes, what is it that stresses them out? 
what are the things that are happening around you that make it so that you have this feeling of you know, stress, of insecurity, of lack of safety. And so we created a setup that can sit on the front and the back of a bicycle um, that has various computing functions, uh, sensors of various types so that we can detect quality of the pavement, closeness of vehicles, the size of the vehicles that are actually passing you, all of these different kinds of things. This is work that we're still trying to get the next phase of it funded, but we did some really cool preliminary work with it already. Um, we actually had a student who spent some time in the Netherlands, and so she compared this really bike-centric place of Delft in the Netherlands, where TU Delft is, uh, to Atlanta, where we were at the time. Um, and so a little bit different, Atlanta, much bigger city than Delft, 1.5% uh, cycling mode share in Atlanta versus 40% cycling mode share in Delft. But both places have places that are mixed traffic where you might not feel as comfortable, things like that. And so we did a bunch of work looking at different kinds of cross sections of infrastructure. We purposely planned routes where people would be in different, the same person would be on different kinds of bike facilities to ask them questions about that and to collect data about their experiences along it. Um, what we saw was that, of course, in Delft, their stress rating was much lower than Atlanta. Um, there were quite a few segments in Atlanta where people said that their stress level was really, really high. And we started to pick that apart, both through survey, but also through looking at the data itself. So in the survey side of things, we were asking people what their causes of stress were. Um, in Atlanta, motor vehicles, number one, by far the thing that was making people feel uncomfortable. Quality infrastructure was the biggest thing that was going to reduce that stress. That was true across Delft and Atlanta. So back to the same things that we were seeing in the, in the study before about perceptions of all of this. Other things that really made a difference to people, um, pavement, actually, as a cyclist, when you have a lot of longitudinal cracks, things like that, it can make a very big difference in where you're placing yourself, and it can make you feel much less safe. Um, so improving even pavement is a very big thing. Um, speed differentials were something that on the stress reducer, like as there was less of a speed differential. So when you can slow the vehicles down, even the presence of the vehicles is not as big of a deal. Um, we also did a number of things using GPS. So we were trying to look on different facilities. Um, was essentially the prevailing speed of the road forcing the cyclist to go faster? And we saw that this was true. So this is part of that stress, is there's a speed you want to be going, and then you're on a facility where the cars make you feel like you need to be going faster. And so you get stressed out, not even because you think you're going to crash, but just because you're having to work so hard because you feel like you have to keep up with that prevailing traffic. And so this is something that we saw. Speed was much lower in Delft, and the riders were much happier with those lower speeds than they were the people who were trying to bike in Atlanta. And so we did a whole bunch of things, again, poor pavement, presence of motor vehicles, poor infrastructure. In Delft, ironically, cyclists were nervous about the other cyclists. So when you have that many cyclists around you, behaviors change. It's a very different kind of thing. I don't know that you have places in the Twin Cities where this is an issue. I come to you from Davis, California, the most bikeable city in America. So we actually have these issues in Davis as well. Um, it's kind of fun to study these kinds of things. But again, the separated infrastructure was the huge piece. That's what people needed to see to be willing. So how do we get people on bikes? We provide that separated infrastructure. So the very last thing that I want to talk to you about is a bigger picture thing um, that I try to now end every talk talking about. Because to me, it is the largest failure of our transportation system and the thing we need to be focused on the most. And that is the fact that we kill more than 40,000 people per year in our transportation system. My husband and I talk about this all the time. Any other engineering field would be shut down at this point if they had this kind of failure rate of their equipment, right? People are terrified to fly, and yet we've had no crashes in the United States where someone has died in decades. But we kill 40,000 people on our roads, and we do very little about it. So there's a lot of research. Whoops, was I in the wrong slide that whole time? Oh, OK. So my question to you, 
How many of you know someone who has died in a car crash? So look around the room. That's a lot of people. I do. I know several people. So I try to use this part because I want to make that number as a big number, and I want to make it personal that you saw how many people around this room actually did lose their life because of a car crash. The thing is, crashes are systematic. There are ways that we can actually reduce this crash rate, and many countries, in fact, almost all developed nations, are doing a better job at this than we are in the United States. So we're starting to move towards this idea of a safe system approach that the USDOT is using. The problem with the safe system approach is it doesn't tell you how to prioritize the things that actually matter within this whole idea that we have to be thinking about traffic safety differently. We just recently did a paper where we're trying to do this. So we came up with this thing called the Safe Systems Pyramid. It's based on work in public health. They've long had a, a pyramid called the Health Impact Pyramid that they use in public health to prioritize improvements that they do. And we've combined this with the engineering hierarchy of controls to come up with one that can be used to actually prioritize uh, how we might spend money to improve safety in the roadway system. So the top of the pyramid, education, not a lot of gains. We spend a lot of money here. So we know it can make a little bit of a difference, these driver education programs, slow down campaigns, but it pales in comparison to the things that we might do further down the pyramid. Active measures, signs, um, signals, in-vehicle collision warnings, all of these things are things where you have to take an action. And so they'll have a greater return than education campaigns will, but you still have to buckle that seatbelt. You still have to react to that sign. We don't do that as well as latent safety measures, signal timing, having a lead pedestrian interval, having airbags in our vehicles. These things are all much better at keeping us safer, study after study has shown, as opposed to something where you have to take action. But what is even better than that is exactly what I'm talking about, the built environment. If we put infrastructure in place that forces people to slow down, you really have no choice in the matter, and we can create a safer system. So roundabouts, curb extensions, raised crosswalks, sidewalks, bikeways, all of these are things that are going to make the infrastructure safer for everyone, the car drivers as well as the pedestrians and cyclists. And then the last one, because I'm here at the University of Minnesota, and this is even a, a lecture that is sometimes tied to social work, I like to bring this angle into this as well. The base of this pyramid, because of what public health has told us, is socioeconomic factors. So how do we create a safer transportation system? We build affordable housing near transit. We have zoning reform. We do things that are going to help lift everyone in society up. This is the kind of thing that, as transportation engineers, we're often like, this is not our world. This is not what we should be worried about. And I'm here to tell you that we absolutely should be. So it's often considered outside of our, our realm, but creative efforts that would actually do this are things like reducing the silos between departments that focus on health and safety and such, and departments that focus on transportation or land use. Supporting aligned efforts between these. Things like zoning and land use policy, workforce policies that reduce night driving, um, shared data systems across departments, all of these kinds of things will actually have a greater impact than anything else that's in the pyramid because it may reduce people driving and traveling in general in time periods that we don't want them to be because they're less safe. So I see I'm not going to have much time for questions. I was told it's OK if I go a little bit past the hour for questions. But the last plug that I wanted to make is for the place that I come to you from, Davis, California. As I said, the most bikeable city in the United States. We have an entire institute of transportation studies there that does all kinds of work beyond the things that I do. We have a transit research and a bike plus research collaborative. But we have lots of other areas that we work in as well. And my new center is called CIRCUIT, the Center for Emissions Reduction, Resiliency, and Climate Equity. And so we're focused on these three pillars of how do we, in transportation, reduce greenhouse gases, have more equitable systems, and be resilient to the climate impacts we're already seeing. So I'm going to leave off the last one. And I'm happy to take questions.
Thank you, Professor Watkins, for sure. the inspiring talk. Um, we have time for a few questions, and I have a microphone that I'll give it to you for asking questions. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you so much, Professor Watkins. You're very inspiring, especially for me personally. Um, I, I have two quick questions. So I went to San Diego. I saw this uh, suburban area where there was 45 mile per hour uh, car traffic and then a painted bike lane uh -huh. next to it. How does this things get built in the US. Like, <laughs> how? Like, and then, the false perception that it might make a difference. <laughs> and yeah. then a second question, do you think that we have failed in our education in terms of how we educate traffic engineers now uh, in, in the US? I'm not sure in other country in Europe how they, but like it, I feel like in our education, we don't teach all of this stuff. Yeah. We don't teach you to see this we don't. from from car, uh, from bike, and from other perspective, we yeah. only look at car as a user. And so, like, what do you think about it? So, in Davis, California, we do teach from all of these perspectives, and it's not just me. Um, and I'm happy to provide materials to folks here if they need them to help in enhance classes that are being taught here. Um, I do think there are many failures in the education system. Um, a good friend of mine just wrote a book called Killed by a Traffic Engineer, Wes Marshall. Uh, if any of you have not yet picked up Wes's book, he is hilarious and it's written in a very unorthodox style for a book, but uh, he makes a lot of great points that build on all the things that I'm talking about right here. And part of that is that our education system is failing that, you know, we're teaching these traditional principles of traffic flow and things like that when we're killing 40,000 people. And it really is not what we should be focused on. Um, I teach our intro to transportation course, at least the design part of it, and the entire class is focused on safety. It's essentially a safety course. I teach all of the same components that you need to take the PE, so you need to know horizontal and vertical design, but the reason that we do almost all the things we do in horizontal and vertical design is actually safety. So if you key everything off of this concept of safety, then you're integrating this in from a knowledge perspective that people know that is really job one. So. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I really think it's a, it's a failure of that we long thought that the bike lane was gonna make a difference and we just needed more and more research to show that it actually doesn't improve safety. It doesn't reduce safety, but it doesn't improve safety. It doesn't really change perceptions. At this point, we know we need this more protected infrastructure on faster roadways, right? That 45 miles an hour, it's not appropriate. I think for years, we shied away from like the Dutch approach, the German approach, because we didn't have the American studies to back it up. Now we even have the American studies to back it up. So I think we're seeing the industry move towards a very different model. And you're doing much of that in the Twin Cities. More could be done, but, but you are a very bikeable city here as well. So. Hey, Carrie, I'm gonna ask you about transit. Okay. So going back to uh, your work really documented how Uber and Lyft um, impacted transit ridership mm -hmm. before COVID. Right. And what I'm worried about thinking about now is actually a different sort of threat, which is um, Uber and Lyft as a threat to transit funding mm -hmm. and their ability to sell themselves as transit mm -hmm. uh, to FTA or other funding mm -hmm. agencies, mm -hmm. uh, especially with the rise of like microtransit and, and these sort of adaptable things that people are trying to do to make transit relevant in the COVID era. So yeah. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about, about Uber and Lyft kind of moving into that territory. Yeah, so we've actually done a bunch of work looking at like the transit agency as the centralized transportation entity and that we really need regulation of these industries to make sure that they are actually filling gaps, right? That you're using it in places where you have a transit desert, where you have densities that are low enough that transit is not gonna serve it well, then you encourage these kinds of things. Um, but you do it more as a feeder than a replacement to transit. And so if we regulate well, then we can make these things happen. We just haven't been so far. 
Um, I think that places across the US and across the world where the transit entity is more core, they're the ones who are like the drivers of policy in the region, making sure that they have that robust backbone of transit and that you're using other things to feed into that. Um, those are the places that you see the highest percentage of transit and cyclists, frankly. So it's sort of part of this whole multimodal system. Um, so I think it's not that we need these things to go away. We just have to focus on how do we regulate them to serve in the places where they need to. Here in Minneapolis, my husband and I were actually shocked at how low ridership. You have an, a light rail system that goes right to the airport, was beautiful for the whole trip, and yet ridership was very low on our trip from the airport to here. So I think there's a lot of other policy, like limiting car policies that probably need to happen. Um, but I think part of it is likely competition from TNCs, right? If that's how, you know, I could again take a poll, how many people in the room use Uber or Lyft to get to the airport as opposed to your amazing light rail system. Um, I, I think that if that was regulated in some way, so there was more encouragement to be relying on transit, then um, we would have those ridership gains. And by the way, Safety is something I didn't talk about in transit because I haven't done a lot of work in this area. It's something a lot of people worry about. But I will tell you anecdotally, as ridership goes up, perception and actual safety goes up. And this is really the problem we're having in COVID is it feels less safe because there are less people on the system. And so if we can get ridership back up, that will actually solve, you know, it's sort of one of these problems that like cyclical kind of thing. So. Yeah, there you go. Virtuous cycle. Exactly. The word that I, was I want to challenge you, and I think okay. your bias showed up when you called Delft a small city. Okay. Having, <laughs> having spent quite a bit of time in Delft, I would not call it a small city. Okay. In the state of Minnesota, for example, single car accidents are where most of the fatal fatalities occur. Yes. And they do not occur in urban settings. Okay. They occur on, actually on at 45 mile an hour roads that are out and about. Yes. Um, and you have this perception of everything being, you're California, everything's just a big city. Um, we have a lot of rural places uh, in California as well. Nobody ever does any research there. It's always done in the city. Okay, okay. And, and that concerns me, especially since you're saying we're failing in our education. Um, I think that you have a perspective or a perception that uh, is very elitist. Oh, I, I would, I don't know about elitist, I would go with urban centric, possibly. Um, but I will tell you about some research that we're actually doing through my new center. Um, we agree that there is not enough focus on the rural pieces of this. In particular, this is not about the safety piece, this is about the climate piece. And what we actually find is that people in rural areas don't have a lot of choice over their housing, and they actually also want to live in sort of these little cores, right? Like they don't want to live in the big city, but they also want to have access to things and be able to go for a walk in the evening and all of these kinds of things. These are prevalent across much of the population. And so um, there's some work that's being done by the University of Vermont a very rural place, um, not entirely unlike Minnesota in many ways. Um, and they're looking at these very things of how do we adapt many of these very urban centric climate principles to a more rural setting, right? We can't rely on, you know, EV chargers everywhere. And like many of the things that we've talked about for a long time, it's just not going to work in a rural setting. So they are tasked with trying to figure out how do we adapt climate principles to do this better. On the safety side of things, I would posit that the safe systems pyramid um, still applies, that there are things that we can be doing in the built environment and socioeconomic realm that would help in rural areas as well. So lighting on facilities has been shown to reduce these single vehicle crashes as well. Um, strategic reductions in speed and figuring out ways to redesign the road so that people understand where it's more than just a sign, but it's actually the road itself that's giving you feedback that you need to be slowing down. These work in rural areas as well. 
Um, and we also have a lot of vulnerable road users in rural areas, right? You go through this, this small town center and you have people, not as much biking, but definitely walking within these places. And many of the crashes are, are you know, vulnerable road users are vulnerable everywhere, even the rural areas. So there's a lot that we can still do in this realm. Um, I am more of a city person, so a lot of the research I presented is more focused on that, but there are actually amazing people doing similar work to what I do um, that are focused on rural areas as well. Great. Uh, we may have time for one quick question, if anyone has a question. Uh, if not, um, I have a small <laughs> gift of appreciation for Professor Watkins. Thank you. For, uh, taking the time and effort and coming here. and. Um, uh, presenting a wonderful um, talk. I'm guessing, is this a... <laughs> it's actually two t-shirts. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. And a mug. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great day. So for fellow hostages.